As a background for this RTD, there has been a general agreement of the problems identified with the highly centralized government. The questions that the roundtable discussion hopes to shed more light on are, is federalism the right solution to these problems? Many still believe that giving more autonomy to the local government units can address current government governance gaps. On the other hand, many proponents of federalism argue that this shift would be able to prove long-term development prospects of the country as well as address persistent issues of regional and special inequalities. We are happy to have three distinguished uh, speakers to help us better understand the ramifications of this shift from a unitary to federal system of government. Briefly, let me introduce our resource persons. Dr. Romulo E. Emeral Jr. is currently the Deputy Secretary General of the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, or CPBRD. He has lectured at the UP School of Economics and currently lectures at the UP Nation National College of Public Administration and Governance. DG Miral's professional interests in social economic policy formulation and reform are in the areas of tax policy and administration, public expenditure management, national government budgeting, intergovernmental fiscal relations. He obtained his PhD in economics from the Australian National University. Our second speaker, Dr. Rosabio Chat G. Manasan, is a senior research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, where she coordinates the research program on public finance and fiscal policy. She has published articles on taxation, public expenditure management, fiscal decentralization, social protection, and other social sector issues. She received her PhD in economics from UP and did postdoctoral studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And lastly, uh, Dr. Uh, Ronald Ron Yu Mendoza is being an associate professor at the Ateneo School of Government. From 2011 to 2015, he was an associate professor of economics at the Asian Institute of Management and the executive director of the AIM Visalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness. Prior to that, he was senior economist with the United Nations in New York. His research background includes work with UNICEF, UNDP, and Federal Research Bank of Boston, the Economics Intelligence Unit, and several Manila-based non-governmental organizations. He obtained uh, his uh, bachelor's in economics uh, honors program from the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines, his master's in public administration and international development from the John H. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and his MA and PhD economics from Fordham University. Before I call on our first speaker, let me just note that uh, we will have our open forum session after the presentations of our three speakers with your indulgence. At this point, may I call Dr. Brunmiral for his presentation. Thank you, Nabendana. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay, well, be, uh, I know that there have been a number of uh, forums already on uh, federalism, and one of the very popular forums is that one conducted at the UP School of Economics entitled uh, Federalism is the Answer and What is the Problem? So I would like to start my presentation with discussing some of the problems. As uh, this proposal on uh, federalism is uh, designed to address certain problems and issues affecting the country. And uh, I think a major problem that uh, really uh, is set the country is the problem of poverty. Uh, if we look at our, uh, our situation, uh, as, the, as the table shows, poverty in the Philippines is persistent uh, compared to other countries in the region. And um, in fact, uh, a number of uh, development plans have been prepared, and uh, basically these are addressed towards this problem of poverty. And uh, this framework, uh, a constraint analysis uh, that was used in the last uh, Philippine development plan, uh, continues to be a major framework, uh, and it seems to be also the framework the underlying framework 
behind the other development plans. And uh, this shows that the poverty is basically uh, can be related to, to governance issues. Because after all, um, economic development like investment is very dependent on a, a stable macroeconomic environment, infrastructure, and um, on the part of the other than economic growth, uh, a major reason for poverty is the unequal access to opportunities like access to basic education, health, and again, uh, infrastructure and other social services. And basically, these are uh, areas wherein the government should be actively involved. So after all, the problem about of poverty is basically a governance issue. Um, and uh, again, uh, these are just indicators showing the overall quality of uh, infrastructures, which indicates the uh, again the lack the lack of competitiveness of the Philippines in terms of this various infrastructure, which is a basic area of uh, public uh, or, or government uh, responsibility. Uh, also, and uh, indicators pointing to the quality of governance, like the use of public funds. Uh, efficiency in government spending and government uh, mobilization of revenues, again indicating the weak uh, position of the Philippines relative to other countries in the region. And uh, these indicators are not only uh, borne out by surveys, but even uh, the findings of the Commission and audit would tend to show that uh, while uh, we have a problem of uh, uh, just uh, financial constraints, we also have, um, or we, uh, when we have some problems about fiscal deficit, there's also um, problems about accountability deficit as indicated by the uh, various COVA findings indicating possible losses uh, in government uh, uh, resources due to these different uh, uh, misgovernance or uh, practices. And the, the poverty can also be related <coughs> to the, uh, as pointed out, the unequal access or the uneven development. And uh, this, uh, uh, again, this table shows the uneven development in the different regions, uneven economic uh, development, uh, which also is reflected in the uneven living conditions in the, different, in the different regions of the country. So as this table shows, um, the, uh, economic activity is basically concentrated in the national capital region, uh, which accounts for around uh, 38%. And uh, together with its neighboring regions like uh, Central Luzon and uh, Calabar Zone, uh, they, together these three regions account for like around 63% of the country's uh, gross domestic product. And uh, if we look at the, uh, the level of poverty incidence across the different regions, you'll see how uh, the economic development is very much related to the uh, poverty incidence. As we will note that, uh, for instance, the autonomous region for Muslim Mindanao, which has the lowest contribution to uh, economic activity, has also the highest poverty incidence. Uh, absolutely, we cannot expect economic development to be even across regions. Uh, we know that uh, agglomeration economies uh, would really favor uh, the concentration of certain economic activities uh, to, uh, to take advantage of economies of scale. But uh, the agglomeration economies, uh, while it may result to an even economic activity or econ an even economic growth in the different regions, uh, did not necessarily result in a divergent living condition. I think the objective really is uh, while you have an even economic activities, or, um, the objective is to at least promote um, a, 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 living, a, living, a living condition, a living standard that is fairly, uh, fairly equal across the different uh, regions of the country. And this is really the objectives of public policy. So that public policy is uh, really is intended to promote 
uh, at least an even level of uh, uh, living condition across the different uh, uh, countries. And this is, uh, will be the topic of uh, discussion later. How, how do we achieve uh, even living condition in spite of, uh, uh, say, an even economic growth across the different regions of the country? And so, again, uh, I think many of the problems that I have pointed out, uh, the, can, can be attributed to the highly centralized government system. I think this is the reason um, why federalism, why the topic of this uh, forum, uh, federalism and local government, uh, is basically designed to address the problem of a highly centralized government setup. And uh, this highly centralized government setup can uh, be viewed in terms of the share of uh, the national government and the local government in, ter in the total government expenditure. If you will uh, look at this table, uh, we'll see that the national government actually accounts for around 83% of the total government expenditures, while the local government only around 17%. So I think that has been a fairly very stable the distribution of uh, government expenditures between the national and the central. So that the central government uh, really dominates government expenditures, it controls the resources. And uh, if we look at the some of the OECD countries, we'll see how the distribution of the government expenditures across the different uh, levels of government. And uh, actually the 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 one, uh, the, the one uh, in shaded blue uh, refers to central government expenditure. But really except for, say, uh, New Zealand, uh, this accounts for like uh, 83 per, around 83%. But really, most of the uh, countries, OECD countries, have a lower share of the central government expenditures relative to total government expenditure. So actually, you look at that around uh, Many countries have uh, the, set, the shares of central government, total government expenditures would be like 60% or less in many of, uh, in many of these countries. Uh, so it's really a challenge of how do we increase the share of uh, the subnational government in terms of the total government expenditures considering that's only around 17%. And if we look at the share in total government revenues, we can see that uh, there's higher degree of centralization. In fact, we know that uh, when it comes to uh, tax, uh, share in tax revenues, uh, we will see that the national government accounts for like 94% total government revenues, while the local government units only account for like 6% uh, uh, of total government revenues. Uh, and again, if we compare this to many of the OECD countries, uh, this table shows the share of the central government expen uh, uh, central government in terms of the total uh, government revenues. And uh, among the federal countries, we can see that uh, the central government accounts for only like around the 50 to 54 to 53 percent total government revenues compared to that in the Philippines, which is like around 92 percent. So in many unitary countries, uh, it's not actually much higher uh, share of the central government, but not as high as in the Philippines. So the average actually for uh, many of the unitary countries in the OECD is like around the, uh, 63 to 65 percent. So the central government accounts for like 63 to 65 percent of total government revenues, again, compared to the Philippines, which is like 93% of total government revenues. So uh, the Philippines is, uh, based on these fiscal indicators, still is really a highly centralized uh, 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 fiscal regime. And uh, what are the implications of a highly centralized uh, setup? Uh, I, the study of the Philippine Human Development Report 2013 is very revealing um, when it comes to the some of the constraints of the problems as, that can be associated with a highly centralized government setup. And that is um, the tendency to be sectoral. 
So if you are if you are actually uh, central centralized, if you organize the central government, your main uh, uh, inclination is to structure it sectorally rather than spatially, so that you have the different departments with the different sectors. In fact, uh, if you look at the deep. Uh, so you have Department of Agriculture, and within Agriculture you have uh, fisheries, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, by commodities. But uh, it's not so much focus on the geographic area. So that, um, uh, and the study of the Philippine Human Development Report says that the local or the geographic dimension is very important when it comes to development. Because many of the government services are actually related. In fact, we've been talking about convergence of government services. But uh, actually, real convergence happens at a particular place, at a particular location. So that uh, it, it shows the importance of geography in terms of promoting the convergence of government services. And uh, that's why. Uh, the focus on geography is very important. And if you are a highly centralized setup, uh, government system, your tendency is to be more sectoral rather than geographic. Uh, so uh, it says that uh, many of the problems in terms of the inefficiency of government services, like uh, 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 weak uh, educational services in that is reflected in terms of uh, uh, missed school attendance, uh, uh, low adult productivity, uh, low agricultural needs can be attributed to this very highly sectoral based uh, approach wherein uh, many of these sectors or departments tend to operate in silos. So it's been, uh, it's been a constant challenge. How do we promote convergence of government uh, services given this setup? Okay. Uh, the next challenge is uh, what we refer to as a common pool resource. As we noted, our tendency is to pull resources to the center so that the national government actually accounts for 93% of the total government revenues collected. And after collecting these revenues and pulling it together, then we spend it to the different localities, bring, uh, bring the services again to the different uh, localities. And in economics, this is uh, replaced a the phenomenon that is what is referred to as the common resource pool. So that uh, you have uh, uh, the national government budget, which is used to finance not only national uh, government services, but also uh, local services. So we talk about uh, clinics, school buildings, uh, which are actually local services that are confined to a specific area. And uh, these uh, local services benefits actually a group of people in the locality. And, uh, if, and if these are funded by the national government, its cost is actually shouldered by everyone. So that uh, there's a tendency for, uh, for uh, the different uh, parties to get as much from that uh, common resource pool, from that national government budget. So actually the name of the game is really grab as much as you can. Anything that you can uh, bring to your locality would be beneficial. And uh, somehow that uh, uh, becomes problematic when it comes to uh, prioritizing government expenditures. Because uh, all government expenditures at the local level seems to be been, uh, would have would give benefit greater than its cost because the, the again the cost is shouldered by everyone collected that from the taxes collected nationwide and uh, these are used to finance services which will benefit the locality so uh, again if you can get something from the, the pool from the national government budget then it will always be beneficial and uh, sometimes uh, this also weakens uh, accountability because uh, you don't care uh, about the actual cost because again anything that uh, is uh, a source from this national budget will always be beneficial uh, and unfortunately uh, the attitude of everyone is to get as much 
and if one is able to get something from that, then it deprives the other. So it's actually it's a really a zero sum game in the end. And uh, this is uh, also what is referred to as the tragedy of the commons. Everybody would like to get something from the pool, but nobody would like to contribute. Okay, I think that uh, is uh, we can understand it actually in terms of the, now uh, we just passed uh, train, uh, uh, train and. Uh, which intends to rationalize or to uh, to address some of the uh, incentives that are being given uh, in, in order because after all many many of uh, uh, many of the different groups would always like to avoid paying taxes avoid contributing to that pool of uh, so so again to summarize these are some of the problems associated with the common pool resource. One is uh, the benefit and cost of public spending is not uh, uh, well appreciated by the people because, again, they only tend to see the benefit and uh, not, uh, not to realize the cost because the cost is shared by everyone, which leads to fiscal, uh, weak fiscal discipline. Uh, in fact, uh, before in the previous Congress, uh, when uh, uh, when there's this the practice of uh, reducing the debt, uh, reducing the allocation for debt service, the main reason why the, the debt service is being reduced is in order to introduce uh, some local projects or provide. But up in the end, actually, uh, since this the, the, the debt service is an automatic appropriation, the result would be, and the president vetoes that. Uh, 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 those the reduction of the debt service in the end the government ends with a bloated budget because of the, of the different insertions uh, but now I, I know that this has been already addressed and, uh, and uh, that practice is not uh, uh, already a thing of the past but uh, again the problem another problem is uh, when you pull resources to the center and then uh, Again, this distributed back to the different localities. Sometimes there's also the problem of uh, the, the timeliness in terms of the releases of the funds. And now uh, we have seen this in actually. In fact, uh, uh, I think there's, uh, we've noticed this, that uh, the problem has, uh, the government, while it has no more, uh, less problem when it comes to addressing the fiscal deficit, a major problem that, is, that has surfaced in the recent past is about the problem of government underspending. And this can be all related to the problem of downloading the funds to different uh, localities in order to uh, provide the much needed services. And um, since the, the, the name of the game is actually to get as much from the center, um, the, in the absence of strong political parties, the main avenue for accessing national government resources and then distributing it to the different localities is through kinship ties. So that's why uh, somehow this, this can be associated also with the proliferation of political dynasties. So the, the kinship ties has to provide a way of really accessing the resources from the center and bringing it to the different localities. So, and we know that uh, the, the politics in the Philippines has been uh, widely discussed as being uh, based on a patron-client relationship where in votes are exchanged for uh, programs, projects, and services. And uh, unfortunately, many of the, these programs and projects tend to be highly clientelistic instead of programmatic base. So that uh, the tendency would be to provide highly fragmented government services that are not very much uh, uh, the kind that would provide a certain impact. Like uh, we have this perennial problem of the, about the lack of the needed infrastructure and uh, critical social services. Okay. Of course, the toleration of corruption because after all, again, the people are just after the projects, anything that they can get from the center would be always be beneficial. Okay. So, 
And that's not only on the expenditure side. In fact, again, uh, there's a tendency for each group to minimize its shares in, uh, in, in contributing to that pool. So if you look at our uh, tax effort relative to the other countries in the region, you'll see that the Philippines is one of the lowest tax effort. And this can be attributed to the various uh, extensions given as to the different groups. Uh, and just recently, uh, we noted that uh, when the, in the, during the discussion of the, uh, the train, uh, we noted that the Philippines, and uh, this is one of the reasons why train was uh, being pushed, the Department of Finance noted that the Philippines has the highest number of uh, line extension when it comes to the value added tax. So that while we have the highest value added tax rate, it's still the, the lowest uh, but effectivity because of these different uh, exemptions. Okay, so how do we reduce the common pool? So, and uh, actually this can be reduced through proper expenditure assignment. Um, in fact, we have uh, uh, initiated this through the local government code uh, by devolving certain functions and services to the different go local governments following the principle of subsidiarity. Although those uh, services that can be done at the lowest level should be done by the lowest uh, unit. And uh, those uh, uh, programs and projects which can be considered as local in nature should be provided by the local government. And those which are national by the national government. And this is what uh, is referred to as uh, fiscal equivalence. So, uh, Basically, uh, and the other is, of course, tax assignment. The board needs some taxing powers also to the local government, following uh, this dictum of uh, finance follows functions. So if you devolve certain functions, you should also devolve uh, the corresponding sources of uh, revenue, so revenue raising powers. And, of course, the appropriate intergovernmental transfers. Uh, we will note that uh, in uh, devolving uh, taxes and expenditure functions to the different levels of government, there's a tendency for uh, uh, to be uh, for the uh, sometimes for the expenditure functions or the expenditure requirement to exceed uh, the rev the corresponding revenue revenue raising powers, and this is what is referred to as the vertical fiscal balance. The, the difference between the assigned uh, uh, expenditure function and the assigned revenue raising powers. Um, and in addition to this, um, since the different localities would have different uh, uh, expenditure requirements and different uh, revenue raising capacities, there's also this tendency to have inequalities among the different areas. And this is uh, supposed to be addressed through horizontal fiscal equalization or achieving horizontal fiscal balance. And in order to promote uh, uh, efficient and effective delivery of government services, there must be coordination and cooperation among the different levels of government. Uh, and I think this way, uh, this, uh, this solution to the common resource pool can, if you'll know, can be addressed both through devolution uh, to the local government code, amendments to the local government code, or uh, what is being proposed, federalism. So I'll, I'll discuss why the difference between uh, addressing this through the local amendments to the local government code and why, uh, uh, may, why one may opt for federalism instead of merely addressing uh, the local government code. First, uh, if we will look at the consolidated public sector financial position, this is the difference between the expenditures and income of the different uh, uh, units of the public sector. We will note that the national government has constantly been in a deficit position. So actually, our target has always been to limit the deficit. 
Uh, in the previous administration, it was limiting the deficit of the national government to 2% of GDP. Uh, in this, uh, uh, with the program of build, 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 we did that uh, has somehow been relaxed. The, uh, the, uh, the limit is 3% of GDP. But what is important to note is the national government has always been in deficit. And on the other hand, if you look at the local government units, this is the total local government sector, you will note that it has been actually in surplus for the longest time. In fact, uh, uh, in 2015, it has a surplus of 179 billion, that is actual. And in two, uh, 2016, it's uh, almost 190 billion, and this is projected to reach 250 billion uh, in, uh, in 2018. So, again, uh, we may ask, because the, it has always been proposed that uh, we just increase, say, the internal revenue allotment of the local government unit. And, but if you will uh, take in, uh, a look at this uh, uh, financial sector position of the national government versus the local government unit, you may also think again why we, we, should, we, sh why we should just uh, increase uh, the allocation to the, to the local government unit because that has been the, uh, the common proposal. So just think about it. And another is the high, like, highly fragmented local government system. Uh, earlier I, note, I noted that uh, the, local gov uh, the national government or the central government in many of the OECD countries accounts for less than 60%. And in the Philippines, um, it's like 92%. So the challenge is uh, to be able to devolve more expenditure functions or more revenue raising powers to the local government units. But what is really the absorptive capacity of the, of the local government units in terms of absorbing these functions that used to be carried out by the national government? Uh, I think in the Philippines, what is very striking is that um, we have very small local government units. In fact, uh, uh, here in this uh, study of the, uh, of the World Bank that uh, was conducted in 2005, it shows that uh, the first year of national government, which is the level of government next to the central government, so this is the provinces in the case of the Philippines, but uh, <coughs> not only the provinces because the independent cities or the highly urbanized cities are actually uh, directly under the national government. So that, that's why it's 149. But that actually was in 2005. In fact, uh, in 2017, as of 2017, the Philippines has already 81 provinces and 145 uh, cities with only two component cities. So that would uh, uh, bring the total uh, sub first subnational government to like 224, 224 uh, first year subnational government. You compare it with say Indonesia, which is a much bigger country than the Philippines, which has only 32 provinces or first year subnational government. So that actually uh, its average population, the first sub tier would be like seven million. Of course, China would be a different uh, comparison. Uh, uh, it has actually, but. Look at that, given the size of China, it's only 32 uh, first year subnational government with an, an average population of like 40 million. So this just indicates to you the level of fragmentation of the local government's system in Philippines. That's why uh, it's, I think the, uh, the idea of creating bigger uh, subnational government, in this case, the regional government which is being proposed in a federal setup because what distinguishes the, the shift to the federal list and compared to just amendments of the local government code is actually the creation of regional governments. It's supposed to be a bigger unit that could possibly absorb uh, or more absorb more of the expenditure and revenue raising powers that uh, is now uh, being exercised by the central government. Okay. Uh, Sorry. So next, uh, again, if we can uh, 
take into account the fragmented government units and with the highly clientelistic patronage politics, this political system, uh, it's uh, more that the result would be uh, more likely highly fragmented government services. So while we will note in the Philippines that uh, the national government actually uh, supervises the different local government units. And this supervision, while it's in the book, it says that the problem that the uh, component cities or municipalities will be supervised by the national government through the provinces. We know that uh, actually the national government deals directly with the different local government units down to the barangay. So uh, actually it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to coordinate government services because uh, what is important is for many of these local government units, really the resources, the, the, once they have the resources, uh, say the barangay did not coordinate with the municipalities it can get resources or projects from the national government. So that the tendency would again be a highly, a highly fragmented government uh, services. Uh, and this is what is important to know. Uh, well, we have been uh, focusing too much, too much on local autonomy. Uh, this study of the World Bank and an another study that was conducted uh, focusing on the Philippines would uh, note that, note that uh, based on international experience, autonomy by itself is not sufficient guarantee of improved governance and service delivery. Because government services are diverse and complicated. They have both national and local dimensions that require coordination and cooperation among players at the different levels. In fact, a, a, a study focusing on the Philippines, a study by Balisakan and, uh, and Hill and other authors also show that uh, effective coordination among government peers requires clear uh, division of responsibilities, adequate funding, and bureaucratic capacity at all, go at all government levels. They conclude that as a whole, the Philippines falls short of these requirements. So what is important to emphasize here is the focus on local autonomy without, uh, and I think this has been a problem which is just, uh, again, consider our traffic problem here in Metro Manila. The MMMDA cannot do much uh, because the local government units in different have, have their own traffic system, they have their own uh, ticketing system, and uh, so that the problem of uh, coordination and cooperation among the different uh, uh, local government, or different levels of government has to be given emphasis uh, in the same way that they're giving emphasis to local autonomy. In fact, if we look at the Philippine Constitution, the focus is so much on local autonomy. But I think that uh, this is something that we need, that needs some rethinking, because as government services, as, technolo as technology progresses, I think there's greater need for the different levels of government to cooperate. So that the focus on local autonomy should be somehow tempered with the need for the different levels of government to cooperate. And uh, I think uh, this is already surfaced like in, the, in uh, one time, the uh, city of Manila imposed a track ban which really created a lot of problem in the, in the logistics uh, uh, system in, the, in our ports. And um, also, I think in South Cotabato, uh, when uh, the national laws, when we allow for open pit mining, the province of South Cotabato actually declared a ban on mining. So uh, there are actually a lot of instances where in, uh, national priorities and local priorities uh, will somehow conflict. And uh, this, as of now, when we are encountered with those issues and problems, what uh, result is just as, um, uh, actually a deadlock. And this has to be resolved somehow. So that uh, I think, uh, uh, again, the importance of cooperation and coordination on different levels should be also given equal emphasis uh, in the same way that we give importance to local autonomy. 
And I think this is what distinguishes the federalism uh, from mere uh, devolution. Uh, in a federal setup, uh, it recognizes two, consti cons two constitutionally established orders of government. And these are primarily the federal government and the regional government. Actually, when we talk about the regional government, it includes the local government. And uh, I think in all the, in the most mature federal countries, uh, which are formed through uh, coming together. Uh, so what we saw in those countries that they used to be independent states with their own local governments. And these independent states federated so that the relationship that uh, was uh, established was uh, a relationship between the state and the federal government and the state dealing with the local government. Actually, uh, direct dealings between the local government and the federal government is not present in many of these mature countries. Uh, so that's one, one aspect that uh, is worth thinking about because as I noted, uh, in our case, the national government deals with the, the lowest lo local government unit by passing, sometimes by passing the different uh, 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 higher level uh, local government units. And again, as I pointed out, the importance of cooperation. Uh, while the focus, our focus is on local autonomy, in federalism, there's also this aspect of shared rule. So federalism is about self-rule and shared rule. Uh, again, uh, and this is very important in terms of uh, really uh, maintaining together the federation. That each, uh, what each state, which used to be independent, has some autonomy in certain areas. And, uh, and in other areas, there is shared rule between the federal government and, and the, and the subnational the state government. And I, just to uh, somehow simplify it, uh, this diagram would show what a shift of federal form of government would be. So that in our current system, in our entire system, where in the national government actually deals with the different local government units, with its different local government units at, as uh, mere agents of the national governments and can do as it please, directly dealing with its different local government units. In a federal setup, we'll note that uh, you have actually the local government dealing only with the regional, dealing mainly with the regional government and the regional government dealing mainly with the national government. And that is actually the setup in many uh, uh, federal, uh, federal countries. So, what are the critical aspects of federalism? First, the proper and clear assignment of functions. There are certain functions which are sh exclusive to each level of government, and there are certain functions which are shared. So again, the self-rule and the shared rule. Uh, and of course, the vertical fiscal balance that is um, providing, uh, assigning expense, um, that each expenditure passed at a different level of government would, should be matched with corresponding revenue raising powers. And the importance of promoting uh, some level of equity, at least in the provision of government services, uh, with each, uh, and, and designing a proper intergovernmental uh, relation and institutions. So uh, I think in many of the federal countries, uh, this, this aspect of self rule and shared rule can be observed in many of their intergovernmental relations and institutions, such as state representation in federal policy making. Actually, in our system, uh, we don't see local government actually uh, direct participation of local government in terms of crafting national policies or even policies that would affect them. But uh, in a federal setup, that is very much uh, part as uh, following this notion of, sh of shared rule. And also intergovernmental fiscal institution to facilitate tax harmonization and fiscal equalization. These are some of the intergovernmental fiscal uh, institutions, uh, which are very critical in federalism. Um, I think we have uh, uh, in the, uh, some of our future discussion with uh, two time for sure to discuss all these different aspects. But uh, somehow, I hope that I, be, I was able to give you uh, 
some distinction between uh, what it entails to just amend the local government code and uh, why and what it entails to um, shift a federal form of government. So I think with that, uh, I, I will end my question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miral. Uh, let me just uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, some of our honorable members. Uh, Madam Jocelyn uh, S. Lim Kai Chong from the 1st District of Negros Red Town. Thank you, ma'am. Congressman uh, Madrel Sagalbaria of the 2nd District of Negros Red Town. Thank you, sir, for coming. Uh, we have also uh, Congresswoman Divina Grace Yu. Uh, first district of the Sabuanga del Sur. And finally, uh, Congresswoman Marisol C. Uh, Panotes uh, of the second district of Camarines Norte. And we also would like to acknowledge the presence of our friends from uh, uh, from PLLO, uh, Yusef uh, Ryan uh, Estevez, Estevez from, <laughs> from PLLO, my friend, and also uh, Sandra Paredes from the League of Provinces. So as for our next speaker, may I please call on Dr. Chad Manasan of PIDS. Good afternoon, friends. I divided my presentation in two parts. The first part is a response to the set of questions that Novell gave us uh, that we should discuss today which is largely centered on the issue of common pool resources as discussed extensively by uh, June. And then I go into a more general discussion of why adopt a federal system of government, why not just amend the local government code. Let me just go, um, take you very briefly through the set of questions raised by Mobile, which is, is federalism the right solution to the following problems? You have a national common pool resource and which uh, various interest groups are able to access and use for basically patronage politics for court barrel politics. The second question is again starting from the notion that you have a national common pool resource. There is such a huge demand for the inclusion of various local projects in the national budget and this tends to bloat the budget resulting in high deficits and impoundment, at worst impoundment sequestration if you have a fiscal deficit target to meet. The third question relates to LGUs uh, trying to access a bigger share in the common pool. So you have unwarranted creation, conversion of LGUs, thirdly, further fragmenting the local government scene. So four questions, is federalism the answer to that? In trying to answer that, those questions, this is how I went through the, the thing. I tried to clarify the problem statement and tried to find a connection between the identified problem and a shift to a federal system. And then I asked the question, is the adoption of a federal system a solution to the given problem? And then I asked another question next to that. Is the best way to address the problem through a federal system? And then what? So, 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 the, so we started with the common pool of national fiscal resource. The existence of the common pool is very real and it's manifested in this table, I'm sure you cannot see, but you have in your handout where I looked at the different departments, the key major spending departments, 
and the, try to sort out the regional distribution of their spending, separating out central office spending from the reg actual regional office spending. Take note that when DPM presents these, sometimes they're not very consistent. Sometimes they put together central office spending with NCR regional spending and say that's NCR. So it tends to bloat the NCR share. And that's why people are so angry about having Imperial Manila. But I just want to do that just to get this question out of the way. And what you see here is that a big proportion of the GAA budget is allocated to the central office. Unfortunately, this is GAA based. You are not, we are not able to trace exactly where that central office spending actually goes in the end, at the disbursement level. Nakatago na yung to sa financial reporting system. But the point here is that you have this pool of money at the central office, which is largely at the discretion of the secretaries who are alter egos of the president. So at the end of the day, the power lies in the president, and that's where people jockey for access to the common pool. So it's very real. And the issue is not so much that NCR and its periphery receives a disproportionate share of national government spending relative to their contribution to the economy or their need for public services. Um, I'm not showing it here. I actually did some computation looking at the relative share of the region, net of central office, relative to, say, their share in the population, their share in GDP. And for the most part, sometimes mababa pa ngayon NCR relative to their population's share. Not all the time, but most of the time fairly balanced. The source of the problem really is the concentration of power and resources in the president as reflected in central office share of the budgets of the different departments. And that concentration of power and resources in the president is the one that provides the venue for legislators to access additional budgetary resources in the common pool via transactional politics. Typically in aid of moving the president's agenda through Congress. So this is a give and take. It's not anybody's fault. That's just the way things fall together, given our system of electoral system, given the party system, etc. Ganun talaga eh. Naglalaro sila. I mean, the president needs to push his agenda. And this is very evident when there is a vote that has to be taken, a critical vote to be taken. Usually, Mary this is at those critical challenges. So, this concentration of power and resources in the president is attributed by many experts experts to the winner-take-all manner of electing the president, the loosely structured electoral parties in the country, and the plurality system of electing members of Congress. If this is the correct diagnosis of the problem, should the solution likely lies in the area of electoral reform and party system reform which by itself is dependent on electoral reform rather than a change in the system of government. Now what has the adoption of a federal system of government got to do with the previous problem just stated? 
to the extent that federal system of government will alter distribution of power between the federal and the subnational governments and reduce the federal budget, the common good may decline. The extent of the reduction in the common pool is, of course, dependent on the distribution of power under the proposed federal system relative to the present one. And here, a critical question is, is the proposed federal system, in fact, more decentralized than the present one? Because I've seen some of the proposals, they're not necessarily so. You'd be surprised. Uh, uh, the concentration of power of the president, prime minister, under the proposed semi-presidential parliamentary form of government, kasi yan na yun, diba hindi lang yung system of government, also the form of government will change. The question is, will it further increase the dominant power of the executive as in other countries who have such a form of government. In other words, much stronger back the executive under the semi-presidential parliamentary than relative to what we have now. And the second question is, relates to electoral rules and the character of the party system under the proposed constitution. Will it result, thank you very much, in more program-oriented political parties, and how quickly will that response happen? Pag ba sinabi natin na, ops, bago constitution, reform na yung party system, automatically, ganun ba ka division? Now, let us look at the second problem. Sabi niya, you have a common pool resource, there will be a huge demand for inclusion of various projects that will tend to increase the budget deficit. From my understanding of the Philippine fiscal performance in the past, it is not clear that this is the case. Rather, demand by legislators for inclusion of various local projects leads to crowding out. Hindi lumalaki yung deficit. Ang nangyayari, naka-crowd out na papalitan yung more strategic projects for more locally focused small projects. So that the government is able to meet the fiscal deficit target. This is very true. In fact, when we were still under uh, the IMF program, di ba nung araw? We have to be under the IMF program, so habol tayo ng habol sa fiscal deficit target natin. Again, the real solution to this problem likely lies in the area of electoral reform and party system reform. Kasi eto na yung court barrel politics, di ba? Presentation so, so this is just a picture of the fiscal deficit, uh, fiscal performance of the government, national government, from 75 to 2016. Uh, if you look from 2000, 1998 to 2005, malaki yung deficit natin. And the reason for that deficit, building meron court barrel politics eh, hindi naman nawawala yun ever. And the reason for the bigger deficit, deficit during that period is the over-optimistic revenue targets of government. Masyadong optimistic yung revenue targets. So when, you, so when the president submits the budget to the Congress, siyempre mukhang maliit yung deficit, pwede siyang gumasta ng mas malaki. At the end of the day, hindi mamimit yung target, ano nangyayari? Hindi i-release ng DBN yung pera, which is what we call empowerment, di ba? Nasabihin ng DBN, o, oh, may automatic 10%, 20% reserve. Hindi ilalabas ng DBN yung saro. 
So when that happens, ano nang nangyari? The power of the first, the power of the president actually increases. Mas, kasi may discretion na siya eh. Diba? Hindi na lang titignan yung appropriation as per GAA. Okay. Pwede nga sabihin, I have, ano nga yung, may third nga yung BBL. Ah, reserve sometimes across the board. Okay, pangapag across the board, di ba? Kasi alam natin lahat tayo 10% ng kaltas. Pero sometimes it's not across the board. Merong uh, appropriations na subject to the approval of the president or the PBL secretary. And that's where the discretion comes in. Okay. The third question, new creation of LGUs. Issue ba ito ng common pool resource? For me, hindi ito masyadong issue ng common pool resource. It's the result of a flaw in the IRA distribution formula, which is the equal sharing portion of the IRA distribution formula. Hindi naman, just because you create LGUs or convert, hindi naman lalaki yung share nila eh. The same pa din yung total share, di ba? Pero yung 40% of PIR collections three years back. Ano ang nangyayari? Ba't nagkikreate ka ng LGUs? Ano ang nangyayari? Nagka, dumadami yung nagahake. Kaya nagagalit yung mga cities, for instance, sa mga bagong created na cities. Kasi diliit yung share ng mga old cities, di ba? It's a zero-sum game. So what is the solution? The solution lies in the amendment of the local government code. Now the last question, last problem posed, centralized power over resources uh, manifested in sectoral versus special orientation of government planning and budgeting. Of the four problems raised earlier, I think this is the only one that has a direct link with the federal system. Kasi nga, pag nag-federal ka, mas malaki yung planning unit, di ba? Hindi lang individually bawat probinsya, bawat city, but they can all plan together as one regional government. So mas, mas may coordination problem. So, so I think ito yung isa na parang good argument for a federal form. Kung hindi ka magka-federal form, ano yung alternative solution mo? Strengthen the Regional Development Council to address need for greater coordination of provincial plan, plus strengthen the role of provinces to address need for integrated planning and budgeting at the provincial level. I know for a fact na may mga bagong legislative proposal towards increasing, strengthening the supervisory role of provinces. Now, let me go to the second part of my presentation, which is, why adopt a federal form? Sabi natin kanina, yung isa is because it promotes greater spatial coordination and planning and budgeting, but meron bang isang reason? Are there other reasons? The, fisc the fiscal federalism literature, which is really based on welfare economics, suggests that there are potential benefits that can be secured by adopting a federal system. Increased efficiency, increased societal welfare, because you are able to, uh, jurisdictions are able to internalize the benefits and costs of public service provision. Otherwise, governments would underprovide services which have positive benefits, spillovers, and overprovide those uh, that only benefit the local jurisdiction. It is also argued that because a federal system brings government closer to the people, Subnational governments are able to respond more specifically to local needs and preferences. And the tendency is enhanced when the population has the ability to
to move from one jurisdiction to another in response to the public service tax package offered by the different local governments. Furthermore, if you it is argued that if you have lower that if lower level governments have some degree of revenue autonomy, meaning they raise a significant amount of revenues from local taxes and user charges, then you then there is increased accountability to voters because the voters will demand for better services because they pay the taxes. A federal system is also said to be key to addressing ethnocultural conflict as it accommodates regional diversity. Now take note that you mga efficiency gains, lahat yon, a function of the extent of decentralization. Said gains can be secured with greater fiscal decentralization with or without a shift to the federal system. So yung mga potential benefits, makukuha mo rin kahit hindi ka mag-shift ng system of government. Basta mag-increase ka ng decentralization. Now, take note that countries with a federal system of government are not necessarily decentralized to the same degree. And some of them may be less decentralized than those with a unitary form. Germany, which is federal, more centralized than Canada, which is federal. Malaysia, which is federal, more centralized than Indonesia, which, which is unitary. So what is important is the degree of fiscal decentralization, not so much the system of government in terms of getting the benefits. Now what is, and June has discussed this somewhat, what is the difference between a multi-chaired unitary form of government, which we have now, now. We are unitary, but we have local governments under the supervision of the central government. Is that under a unitary government, the powers of the local government are essentially delegated to them by the central government, and the central government can unilaterally withdraw the powers delegated to subnational units. Under a federal system, the division of powers are written in the Constitution. In other words, they're guaranteed. The division of powers is guaranteed in the Constitution. I want you to remember that because later on, I will, that is one of the questions I think that we should be asking ourselves when we look at the various proposals in of proposed new constitution. Talaga bang yung division of powers ay guaranteed? Baka naman contingent on actions of the legislative. Kung ganun din pala, in, nasaan yung advantage ng federal for sa decentralization under a unitary system? Now, if the objective is to secure the potential benefits from more decentralized governance, principles that guide the design of the fiscal aspects of the federal form are just as relevant for reforming decentralized governance in a unitary form. These principles are aimed at ensuring that the federal and state governments face the right incentives for an efficient, equitable delivery of public services. The design of the fiscal aspects of a federal form revolves, involves four pillars of intergovernmental fiscal relation, expenditure assignment, which level of government does what, tax assignment, which level of government taxes what, intergovernmental transfers, panel that she shared, and resources, and then subnational credit finance. Are states, will states be allowed to access foreign credit markets? What are the rules for borrowing? Can subnational governments borrow as much as they want? Those type of questions. Five minutes. <laughs> uh, the overarching principles in design of fiscal features, 
position and what do you do and establishing clarity in expenditure assignment. June seems to be worried about NGUs or subnational governments having too much autonomy. I think the question is rather than too much autonomy period, it's there sh it should be clear kung ano yung mga responsibilities nila, ano yung mga functional assignments nila. And for yung mga functions na assigned to them, dapat autonomous sila doon. Hindi sila lalabas doon sa kanilang uh, responsibility. So kung sinabi natin LGUs or subnational governments are in charge, should be in charge of the operations of public hospitals. Ibig sabihin, autonomous sila with respect to the operation of public hospitals. In, it is important that state governments have a significant degree of having autonomy, meaning hindi sila simply dependent on transfers from the central government. They are able to raise some of the resources through local taxes. Importance of ensuring that subnational governments face a high budget constraints, meaning kung nagka-utang-utang yung LGU or sub-state government for that matter, at nag-default na siya, mag-bail out ba? Sasagipin ba siya ng national government? The principle is dapat hindi. Otherwise, lahat na ng state governments will borrow excessively in the hope that the federal government will bail them out. And if that happens, then we will experience the kind of macroeconomic instability problems that face Argentina, Brazil in the 90s. Diba? High in, hyperinflation nawawalan na ng value sa regini ng pera. The importance of the equalization plan to mitigate risk of worsening disparity in human development outcomes. Ito, pinapakita ko lang how wide the disparities uh, in gross regional product, domestic product, per capita household income, and poverty incidence across region. So may mga regions na talagang sadyang mayaman, NCR, 3, 4, 8, may mga regions na as of now, medyo nandun sa papa. Papano na sila? But even more important than the assignment of specific expenditure function and taxing powers to the federal and state governments is the internal consistency of the four pillars in terms of having the federal and the state governments face the right incentives. Dapat consistent. In maraming ways, there is no one federal model. But what is important is they are internally consistent. Now, the question to ask, marami na tayo nakikita proposal. I'm sure sila Congressman Nagtado, marami na nagsubmit ng proposals. For me, here are two questions I want to ask. When I read the various proposed uh, federal constitution, how much more decentralized is the proposed regime relative to the present regime? Some of the proposals I read, as I and if that's the case, okay, Bayon. When we say that the benefits from the adoption of the federal form comes from the degree of decentralization, the second question is, how well articulated is the division of power between the federal and the state governments in the proposed constitution? Meron ba talaga constitutional guarantee? And I did, I read a couple of proposals and my reaction is, 
Akala ko ba federal constitution ko? Bakit a lot of things relative to the division of powers is contingent on the action of parliament. Contingent on uh, the prime minister saying that the state governments have the capability and the financial capacity to perform the function. If that's the case, if it's contingent on action of Congress, action of the Prime Minister, where is the constitutional guarantee? Hindi ba pareho na lang din yun na amendment ng local government po? And kung hindi siya decentralized, hindi ba para paurong ito, hindi pa suro? Now, a shift of federal form comes at a cost. And when I talk of cost here, this is just the bureaucratic carrying cost. Meaning, magkakaroon ng gobernador at the regional level, vice governor, na wala pa tayo ngayon. Magkakaroon ng senators, second chamber lalaki, dati 24 lang yung senators natin, with the second chamber According to PDP Laban, either 3 to 7, depending on the version you're reading, per regional government, the salaries of the judiciary, kung uh, meron ba, bawat regional government, the judiciary, uh, salaries of state legislators, may sangbunian, the equivalent of the sangbunian at the regional government level, iba-iba ang numero niya. The estimate of the additional fiscal burden is 44 billion to 72 billion per year. Per year. No, this is for the entire country. Depending sa ating the funding process is reasonable. Ang comparison to dito, just uh, ako may itang sweldo ko. So, <laughs> pinapagtawanan ako ng husband ko. Because he says, pag tinitignan ko yung sarili kong budget, a few thousand pesos malaki sa akin. But when I look, because I'm a public finance person, when I look at the national government budget, a 3 billion peso national government budget, okay yan. Uh, public sector deficit of 300 billion, pwede pa. So you think in millions. What is 72 billion per year? 72 billion is about half of the revenue projection for trade one. Kung nag-aaway-aaway tayo ngayon, kung okay ba o hindi okay ang daming nagagalit sa atin, just to put it in perspective, alahati ng trade one yan. Now, what are the risks in adopting a federal system of get government? Getting the design of the fiscal aspects, right? Yon na discuss ko na. Pag hindi tama yung pag-design mo, mag-widen yung disparities. Pag wala kang revenue autonomy o masyadong maliit, hihina ang accountability. Pag unclear yung expenditure assignments, Again, poor accountability. Pag hindi consistent, you might have state governments na kulang ang pera, hindi makadeliver ng services, or sobra ang pera, and then waste. The second risk relates to how will the adoption, pa paano maa-adopt? And Pwede na-design natin properly at the start. Madali lang siguro yun. Perhaps that's the easiest part. The designing part. Getting it right. But, what is the likelihood that the initial model will be changed 
to reflect the particular interests of framers of the new constitution. And here the question is, con as or con con? There is a study by the World Bank that says, Congress is an institution not likely to be inclined to expand the resource base of the Chinese, which is what it means. But it's not enough to expand the resource base of subnational governments, which is essentially what you want to happen when you shift to a federal system of government. Sabi ni Matsuda, fiscally stronger LGUs depend less on individual national legislators for financial assistance and hence would result in the loss of political leverage for members of Congress. So, ayaw daw nila. Malapit na akong paalisin dito, kaya... The third risk, the third risk relates to the fact na na yung fiscal aspects of fiscal of a federal system does not operate in the vacuum. Important then yung political incentive structures that affect the behavior of elected public officials. And in regards to these, some um, experts point to preconditions for the success of the federal system. The first one is reform of party system that you have so that you have more programmatic rather than clientelistic system. And the second one is minimizing high barrier to entry in political arena, which is really the political dynasty question. Now, without the precondition, likelihood of elite capture is large. And let me point out that when I talk of preconditions here, Preconditions should be understood in the sense of the conditions occurring prior to event X in a sequential manner. It's not enough that the preconditions plus the adoption of a federal system occurs at the same time or contemporaneously. Why? Sabi nila, the consolidation of the party system takes much longer than the establishment of the constitutional structures. So formal rules can be changed very fast. Pag na-approve sa plebiscite, yung bagong constitution, yung na yung bagong rules. But the informal rules take place. At nandun pa din, kung may dynasty na, nandun pa din sila. They have all the powers. They have monopoly over the powers. So that's one reason. So two options to choose from, adapt a federal system, change the constitution, or reform, reform the fiscal aspects of the local government. So your choice depends on your assessment of the valuation of the potential benefits and the risk involved. Uh, involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chatmanasan. We have one more speaker. And before I, I call the last speaker, may just acknowledge the presence of Congressman Raul Delmar of the First District of uh, Cebu City uh, and uh, Congressman Noy uh, Lechon of the First District of Oriental Mindoro. Thank you, sir. So, uh, may, may I, at this after, may I call our last speaker? Uh, Dr. Ronald Mendoza, uh, and after Dr. Mendoza's uh, presentation, we will be having our open forum uh, later presentation. Sorry? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to share that uh, the two previous speakers really stole my thunder at this point. Most of what I will say are already said very, very well by the two previous speakers. I will just add a little bit of our research from Ateneo Policy Center on Political Dynasties, uh, which uh, relates to the governance aspect of this entire uh, policy issue. Uh, our contention is that uh, much of the discussion today about systems, about forms of government, actually if you drill down to the essence of it, you have to go to governance. 
and it's really in the electoral system, in the strength of the political parties, uh, and the competition in the political space. And if that is not fixed, then it becomes difficult to imagine that any change in the form will actually produce anything different. Because if the political system is anti-competitive, uh, it's difficult to imagine that a new set of rules will make uh, a big, big difference in how the behaviors, the policies actually take place. So that's really the gist of my, my presentation. And in the end, we have an idea, uh, a proposal, on how to deploy our intergovernmental transfers in a way that is at par with the best practice in many other countries. And essentially the idea is to reform our era and to reform the way that we channel our public finance so that we put an end to the perverse incentives of the common pool research, which is what uh, Dr. Miral and, and Chad elaborated. And we have an idea for that. That idea, by the way, can be incorporated in a federal form of government, or quite candidly, a reform of the local government code. You do not need to change the form of government. We can implement that idea by simply reforming the local government code. And in fact, after over 20 years of the code, I think it's only appropriate that we look at how to improve it and actually build up on it. So, uh, this is a presentation, I'm just gonna go through it uh, in an expedited manner. I always start with the development trajectory of the country. And uh, this shows the real GDP per capita for the country from 1960 to today. And it essentially shows a mixed development picture. Uh, as we start out with the real GDP per capita in 2005 US dollars of about 1,000 in 1960. By 2016, even though we have improved dramatically, this is only a two-fold increase in the real GDP per capita of the country. Our neighbors manage a six-fold increase, this is Malaysia, and a seven-fold increase, this is Indonesia. So this is the story of the country right now. While we are experiencing very, very promising growth and development, we are actually just catching up lost ground. Um, the challenge then, and this is part of the narrative, I think this is part of what we need to remember about our history and why we're even talking about federalism today, is that there was an extreme concentration of political and economic power before 1982, which was when our economy collapsed. That concentration of political power was actually in the hands of one clan, one family. And it is part of our history. It has been published extensively and no amount of changing that will escape this reality, which is the concentration of political power resulted in a very, very bad economic situation for the country. This is actually what drove many of the reformists to implement the local government code when the dictator was kicked out because of the concentration of political power that had a very bad uh, experience, left the country in a very bad experience. So this is where we're coming from. This is a formula actually of Dr. Robert Clintgard of Harvard University. When does corruption take place? It is when the monopoly of political power plus a lot of discretion with weak accountability is combined. You have a trifecta of the high possibility of corruption. And this is why the political concentration of power is something that we feel needs to be corrected in the country. What happened in the post-Marcos era? What was the promise of democracy uh, in 1986, 1987? That promise included reforms like the local government code, if you recall. But the problem was, and this is in the words of my friend Alex Laxon, instead of kicking out one dictator, we ended up with many mini dictators spread across the country. So while we decentralized some of the political and economic power, the end result is a concentration at that local level. This is not necessarily a full decentralization of political power to the citizens. So you go to the various parts of the country and you will see this concentration of political power at, the, at those levels. So the rationale for decentralization, I'm not going to belabor this point, it was to break up that centralization of political and economic power and bring much more 
uh, political choice and political power as well as economic uh, development to the rest of the country. What we have now is something perverse, so not what the framers of the local government code actually aspired for. What we have is a continued debate, what we call uh, the citizen is stuck between Imperial Manila and the dynastic countryside. Each one pointing to each other on who's doing the wrong thing. And in fact, and we are all Filipinos in this room, so I'll be very candid. There is a lot of blame for all of us and for both sides. So there's a lot of room for improvement on all sides of the democratic uh, landscape. I'll show you the, the two sides. Is Imperial Manila the problem? A lot of this has been discussed already, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, it is the beneficiary, so these are the allegations. A beneficiary of disproportionately large share of public spending, and Chad very nicely put the disaggregated figure. If you take out the HQs, actually, NCR doesn't get an imperial share. The empire actually has to do with the centralized nature of the agencies. So that's sort of a superficial centralization. Maybe there is a reform, full of government reform that we can pursue to take out that centralization. E-government, uh, make government much more efficient and the bureaucracy not so uh, bloated. Uh, Imperial Manila is also set to control public spending allocations to the LGUs, and, and I think Romy and Chad also elaborated on this already. And it passes on unfunded mandates to the LGUs, which I hear uh, many of the local government executives really complain about. There's a lot of things to do, but no resources planned on how to execute uh, in, a, in a complete way. I'm not going to belabor this point. Most of the central of the resources are actually captured by central agencies or collected by central agencies. And if you look at the spending, most of the spending is also allocated, channeled through central agencies. So that's sort of the concentration of public finance in the country right now. This is not something that cannot be addressed by reforming the local government code, yet again. But the reality for the country is not just about public finance. It is the concentration of economic activity in only a few areas of the country. So even if you look at um, devolving some of the tax assignments, if you look at where the wealth is being created, where the economic activity is, um, send, uh, local governments can apply those, some of those taxes, but there's not so much revenue to actually be generated. And in fact, the challenge for competitive local jurisdictions is not to apply a lot of taxes so as to attract more business and more investments. So there is that inherent challenge of uh, the tax assignment in that case because the reality for the country is that there is an economic concentration of wealth in only a few areas in the country. Um, I'm not sure if you see this, but I hope it's in the handout. Uh, the concentration of real GDP per capita also, you can see NCR right over there is three times the real GDP per capita of the average of the country. So that essentially, uh, the wealth is where you're sitting in right now. But if you look at the rest of the country, and if you look at places like Arm, Bicol, Caraga, these are very, very small real GDPs per capita. Right? So the economic activity concentrated. And there is an inequality in human development that is matching that economic concentration. So if you look at, this is just an example for illustration of human development levels of different provinces in the country compared to countries, actual countries in the world. NCR is comparable to Thailand in uh, terms of human development, right? As measured by the Human Development Index. But places like Lanao del Sur and Sulu are comparable to places like Nigeria. And places like Maguindanao and Tawi Tawi are comparable to places like Zimbabwe and Afghanistan, which are really, really severely um, underdeveloped areas in the world. Now that inequality in human development also reflected in the inequality in life expectancy. Uh, these are just some examples and basically reflecting the points raised already by Chad. Region 1, a female can 
reach until 76 years old, average life expectancy, but in armed, you can only reach 63. Now, the thing about this is we add insult to injury with the nature of our policy. Here's a policy, an example of a policy in Makati. They always like to give this as an example. Sino po ba dito taga Makati? Walang taga Makati, okay. Uh, masarap po kasi sa Makati, apparently they take good care of their uh, senior citizens. You cannot read this, but uh, free movies, free consultation, cash gifts, uh, all the movies you can want to see for free in Makati, life begins at 60. This is the tagline. It's, it sounds very nice, right? So all of us want to retire in Makati, right? But the, the challenge for the country, if you look at the inequality, is in our life ends at 60. So this is what our citizens are looking at, the degree of inequality in terms of the standard of living across the country. And Makati is a jurisdiction that receives over 880 million in ERA every year. Despite its wealth, despite its war chest of revenues, and despite the many of the mining companies, many of the multinationals calling Makati its HQ, it still receives ERA. So this is sort of the, in my view, uh, an accentuation of the inequality because you do not need to uh, have government accentuate what is already unequal. So there is something that needs to be reformed in ERA. Now the other side, of course, is if Imperial Manila is a problem for development, then is the dynastic countryside any better? And I, I submit all of this evidence in humility. I know there may be some uh, representatives in the room from political plans. Ito naman po pinipresent ko dahil bansa po natin to and I care about it. And I hope uh, this is how you will take this. I have many friends and students from political plants in Ateneo School of Government. And I always advocate that part of the change must come from these plants as well. Well, this is what our country and our democracy looks like. Governors, 70% of governors in 2007 were from political plants. By 2016, 81% of governors are from plants. Hindi ko na po sasabihin lahat, no? pero representative, since we are in Congress, 75% of representatives in 2007 were from political plans. It is now close to 78% by 2016. What is wrong with this concentration of political power, even if you set aside the Marcos years, which is, which is really another example of concentration of political power in the hands of one clan? Why is this a challenge for us? Well, I'll give you one anecdotal example and then the country itself, which is done through an empirical study published in Oxford Development Studies, which is a good journal. This is one anecdotal example. Violent political competition in one of our provinces, and in this case, four congressmen, sorry po, matakot po kayo, four congressmen dead between 1989 and 2005. Ina-assassinate po sila. And what happens to their province even as their congressmen are being assassinated? Well, 53.56% poverty in 2006, 56% poverty in 2009, and 51% poverty in 2012. Violent competition, but nothing changes in the lives of their constituents. So this is not the right type of competition that we need. We need a competition of ideas. We need a competition of good governance. And this is an anti-competitive situation. Here's another example, Dinagat Islands. These are the leaders in Dinagat Islands. If you actually put in a pie chart who has a political office, who holds political office in Dinagat. There is one family that holds 10 elected official uh, positions in Dinagat Islands. And what does their port look like? Sorry, this was no longer animated, but this is where their governor lives. Right? And I guess when I present this to young people, I always mention there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. We need a lot of people to become wealthy, to make our country wealthy as well. Nothing wrong with this. The problem, of course, is you're the only one becoming wealthy and everyone else is impoverished. 
there's something wrong happening. And we see a lot of this inequality. Makati po is not the only unequal picture in our country. It is reflected all over the country. And uh, even though we like to take that picture between the nice skyline and then the shanties underneath the Makati skyline as the picture of inequality, I would argue that if you went around the country, you would pretty much see that inequality as well reflected in other ways. So this is our study, not just an anecdote. We looked at the rest of the country. We looked at all the political dynasties, not about particular families. It's about the overall pattern of governance. And I hope the clans themselves will listen to this because we are headed for the dogs if we are able to fix this. The situation is that the fatter the political dynasties, the deeper the poverty becomes. And this is no longer just a correlation. Kasi po sinabi nung isang presidential ball in the last election, hindi naman po porket nandung kami, kami nag-cause ng kahirapan. Sinabi po nung isang candidate. Pinag-aralan na po namin para ma-prove namin na pagka lumalabo yung mga political plans, lumalalim pa ang kahirapan. Ibig sabihin, talagang konektado dun sa pattern of governance. And if you can just imagine, a governor is the matriarch, the vice governor is one son. Three out of the five mayors are also sons of the governor. The congresswoman is a daughter. Two provincial board members are also related to the governor. It is difficult to imagine governance take place under these conditions, no matter what Romy and Chad do with public finance. Because this is a fundamental flaw. Kahit ano pa pong gawin natin dun sa public finance design, kung ganun po ang sitwasyon, malamang magkakaproblema po. So, we have a simple proposal and I'll begin to wrap up on this. This is a very practical proposal. It can be done through the amendment of the local government code. It is essentially a design of our public finance system to once and for all get rid of the common pool uh, resource problem. How do we do it? The argument is simple. If you have a vector of poor governance to best governance among the local jurisdictions, and a vector of low income to high income across the jurisdictions, so the level X and Y axis, you can put in these boxes the entire country, the different local jurisdictions. So if you are poorly governed, mababa po yung governance indicators, and you are low income, the design of the intergovernmental transfer should likely be conditional transfers and conditional grants. You should not be given the intergovernmental transfer without governance conditions because most likely that will be captured. So, kung in-implement nyo po ang mga reforma, pinalakas nyo po ang public services, nando po ang resources, the intergovernmental transfer. Now, if you are in the middle, you are slightly better governed and you are slightly a middle income level local jurisdiction, you can then get unconditional and matching grants. Big sabihin, dumalaki yung transfer sa'yo ng center or ng rest of the country because you are now doing the right thing and reaching an economic critical mass. And if you are best governed and high income, just like Makati, right? Marami na silang pera. They have a lot of revenues. The war chest in Makati is huge. Then you probably don't need a transfer from the center anymore. You should graduate. And what you should do, and this is the nice thing that Chad mentioned earlier, is probably we should start thinking of more sophisticated public finance instruments, like debt instruments. Access to domestic uh, debt markets and access even to international debt markets with the proper fiscal discipline, which the Latin American countries perfected because of their crisis experience. So we don't need to go through the crisis anymore, we can learn from them and implement it properly without going through the mistakes. So places like Makati, debt instruments for LGUs and municipal bond, bond markets, which by the way, we can also leverage our very young population as well as the OFW population who are really thirsting for instruments to invest their money in. Rather than buy condominiums or cars, they can actually invest in our country and the development of our local bond markets. 
So these are things that are coherent also with what we are capable of as a country right now because we have a lot of liquidity that we can park in these areas. Uh, this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ron Mendoza. At this point, may I ask our three speakers to please sit at the front table for our open forum. Again, we would like to thank our three speakers for their insightful and in-depth discussion of the federalism issue. I think they have made a key point how crucial it is to get the slippery slopes of the reform process right if ever the shift to federalism pushes through. Let me just acknowledge the presence of some of our guests today, representatives from the UF, EPM, uh, Senate offices uh, like SEPO, STSRO, PLGF, NETA, and PLG. Uh, we, we thank you for coming uh, to this forum. At this point, uh, may we ask uh, our honorable uh, House members if they have some, if they have any comments or questions to our panelist speakers. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to throw a question to the last speaker, which we were, of which he was very much emphasizing about uh, uh, political dynasties. Uh, how, do you, how do you correlate political dynasties with the transfer from unitary to federal? Number two, but in fact, we had, very, we had two very good presidents in this country, both were Aquinos, and as shown in your graph, this, both presidents did very well. And the United States, we had both Bush, that did also very well. So how do you distinguish now, or try to say that uh, dynasties, political dynasties, is the core source of corruption in this country? So sometimes, maybe you have to explain better, what do you really try, what are you trying to say? about political dynasties. That's my question, thank you. Congressman, thank you very much for that question. Uh, it's always a challenge to explain this in front of congressmen. <laughs> um, partly because I think the reality is that we get leaders you are a leader in your, in your uh, jurisdiction. Uh, but we do not have the counterfactual. Yung salita po counterfactual is what kind of leadership we could have produced if we fixed these problems, right? If you had strong political parties, if you did not have vote buying, if you did not have cheating, if you did not have these violent competition in these jurisdictions, what could our leaders have been capable of doing in this country? And I think most of you have to agree that we us would have been unshackled by this underdeveloped political system. The discussion would have been so elevated, I think, such that this country, nothing could stop us, if you, if you ask me. So my, my main point on the dynasties is that if there are fundamental flaws in our governance system, it is difficult to imagine the rest of the system functioning well because the rest of the system will adjust to that fundamental flaw. So if we are unable to bring real political competition in the selection of our leaders, the kind that you don't need to worry about your safety, you don't need to worry about raising so much money to run for office, the kind that actually encourages citizens to contribute to your kitty to run for office because I believe in what your advocacy is. That kind of leadership, and, and therefore it's not just about the congressmen or the senators, it's about all of us citizens. How many times have I heard congressmen, mayors, governors complaining that citizens line up outside of their houses asking for help, asking for help, uh, money for help spending, asking for jobs, asking for any number of things that this is not what a modern democracy does. So it is in this way that I hope the, the discussion of dynasty sort of is, is taken. Um, the average figures which I showed you, 
which shows that the dynasties are creating more poverty. Kasama na po dyan yung sinasabi po matitino at saka yung hindi po talaga matino. Magkakasama po sila doon. Pero pag pinagsama-sama po yan, the average effect is still negative. How do we interpret this? The negative effect of the worst of them is so strong that the good effect even of those dynasties who want to do the right thing is swamped. Napakalakas po nung negative effect nung pinakamasasama. At palakas po ng palakas yung tendency na yun kasi the game is to actually expand. The game is to take more political positions because then you have more public finance control. Ilang po, ano ang kitty ng mayor? Ano ang kitty ng governor? Ano ang kitty ng or resources ng meron pong masasabi dito sa kongreso. This is the reality for us right now. I hope I answered Congressman your report. Can I have a follow-up yes, question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, my follow-up question is something like, when you said earlier, I think one of the best answers to this is to strengthen the political parties. Rather than focus more on dynasty, but by the way, I do not belong to a family coming from any dynasty. I'm the first one to make, to make everybody, to, for everybody to know. I'm the first one. Uh, the first congressman in our family. <laughs> I do not come from a political dynasty. But because I always have this thought and advocacy in which if you're a doctor, what you are talk, what you, between your son, your daughter, your family, among yourself, you discuss about medicine. If you're an accountant, most of the time, during dinner table, during lunch time, you discuss about things that is happening concerning accounting. If you're a businessman, so be it. If you're a politician, what is being discussed in the table during dinner is about politics. And how do you expect my son, my daughter, and not to go into politics when what is being discussed in the table during lunch or dinner or breakfast is about politics? Or it is about medicine. If you're a doctor by, by profession, if you're a teacher by profession, then you discuss what are your thoughts? What did you do in school and how do you how you how can you stop the disparity in a sense that when we discuss something about politics, they want to they want to be politicians, then I don't issue. You. You're the father, you have the family, they look at you, oh, he's doing good, he's doing his best. I want to be like him, and we cannot do that. Are we trying to say that if your father is a doctor, you should cannot no son should be a doctor? Is that is that what we're trying to say? I think we have to really to define what dynasty really is. Maybe an exchange of father, daughter, something to that effect. But to generalize the word dynasty, I think is not very fair. By the way, I do not come from a political <laughs> dynasty. That I want to mention. Thank you very much. Do you still want to reply? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm Sir, this was the very same argument used by that presidential when he was talking about, and he was from a dynasty. Uh, in fact, he's from a hati. Um, so, uh, so, Congressman Sagabaria, I, I think, it raises a, an interesting point. Imagine the power of growing up, rubbing elbows with governors, congressmen, and mayors and going to good schools like Ateneo, La Salle, UP, what will stop you? Or even more, yeah? What will stop you? To me, there is, we cannot blame that young person for having all of those advantages. But we can blame ourselves if there is an alternative leader out there, like that young person I saw from USD, nandun sa likuran sa kanina, who is not the child of a congressman, not the child of a governor, and can easily be our Abraham Lincoln or our Barack Obama. But we did not notice this person, this young leader, because malilang ang last name niya. At hindi siya nag-aalbusan lang mga kasama niya ay mga members of Congress. I would like to believe that our leaders want a more egalitarian society for this country. We do not want a country where there is an elite that is separated from the rest of a very young population that offers a lot of good for the country. 
And if you grow up in such a country where there are egalitarian uh, options, everyone can be. Pag tinanong niyo po sa US ang kindergarten, what do you want to be when you grow up? Meron pong sasagot na gusto niya maging presidente. Kahit saan po sa US kayo magtanong. That is the kind of country that they have. But if you go to our schools, what do you want to be when you grow up? Tingnan niyo po kung ilan ang sasagot na gusto nila maging congressman o mayor o governor. This is reserved for a certain group in the country. Fortunately for Congressman Sagarbaria, he did not believe in this reservation and actually competed for that post. We need to produce more of those leaders. And again, nothing wrong with those children of leaders who have all these advantages. It is an advantage that you can use for the good of the country. But the problem is if that advantage makes the, le the playing field not level. And it is an advantage that is transferred purely by kinship and nothing else. My last message always to the leaders is, what is much more powerful that you transfer your reform not to your son or daughter, but to someone totally unrelated to you, but will fight for the reform that you spent your entire life fighting for? This is the strength of political parties. This is why Republicans recruit in high schools and colleges in the United States. And they get young Republicans and young Democrats. They believe in the reform. So ang pinulong po doon, kahit magre-retire na po kayo, you are assured that there are armies of Republicans and Democrats ready to take over what you started and continue it. This is the continuity of institutional reforms. And so I very much agree with you, sir, that it's not just the dynasty regulation. I, I don't like to call it anti-dynasty because we are not anti any leadership. We are about fair political competition. This is what we're advocating. But the fair political competition must also be addressed on the supply side, which is really to strengthen political parties and enable alternative young leaders to compete. Uh, are there any more questions from our class members? Okay, at this point, uh, we will open the floor to our uh, to, to the audience. Uh, let me just note a few house rules for our open forum. Uh, please kindly identify yourself and your organization. Please try to be brief and concise in your comments and questions, and if possible, identify the speaker or speakers the question is being directed to. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, I will be getting three questions at a time so that we'll be able to uh, pose uh, more questions. So, um, Ma'am Reyes, then you, Ma'am. Okay. I'm Sam Reyes. I'm the policy advisor of Council and Madoka Board. I'm very happy to see my friends here. And uh, I think this hearing was very, very enlightening. Um, I think it's actually a comment uh, rather than a question. I think what is very complicated now is that uh, in the discussions, there are actually two aspects that are getting conflated. One is uh, the shift from the presidential system that we have to a presidential parliamentary, which is really more than executive legislative relations. And the shift from unitary to federal, which is really about national and sub-national government relations. So that becomes a little bit, you know, complicated. And what Chad was saying, and I agree with Mark, that uh, in terms of the shift to the president of parliamentary system, what you really need is a electoral system reform and also the party reform. Which, because the electoral system right now, uh, where this winner takes off, where there's for the election of the president, you anyone who gets the highest number of votes wins no? because we have the single ballot third system. As against, for example, a uh, two ballot majority system where you have a runoff. So if nobody wins in the first balloting where you have five like we have, then you have a runoff between the two parties. And that becomes a more representative. But that's another question. And also uh, the, the current system of plurality among the members of the Congress where it gets the highest number of votes automatically wins. The problem also is when you shift to a parliamentary system, 
You need strong political parties. As you said the other way around, that the parliamentary system creates a strong party system. It's a strong party system that would create a stable parliamentary system. And unless we address that, it becomes a little bit very, very difficult to shift from one to the other. But going to the unitary federal, um, initially I was for federal because I believe that women will have more chances of people representation and participation in the federal system because the, 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 the arena gets a little bit smaller so we can compete, we have more chances to compete and win. But now learning all about this, about the, the finance uh, aspect and about the cost, by the way, you're the first I heard it really cost the shift to federalism. Because this morning I, I attended a center and they were asking how much it it cost, and they didn't know. So yours is really a very good argument. So, um, and of course, Ron, I mean, I uh, am an evidence-based policy, you know, uh, analyst, and I uh, very much appreciate the work of the Ateneo School of Government. So all I'm saying is that's very complicated. You know, it's not something that one can resolve uh, just by shifting to one system from uh, what we have a presidential to a presidential parliamentary, from here to federal. There's so many, many factors. You have the political culture, you have the political economy, you have the, you know, the party system. So I guess forums like this that you organize is very enlightening. And we hope that we'll really get very, very balanced view of the issues. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, yes, for your question. Good afternoon. I'm Christina X. Mundo from the National Security Council. Yes, political dynasties do not stay long, actually. I came from one. <laughs> but then, um, now more than my office, I graduated from the UK uh, law, and the, we have the parliamentary system there. The question, actually, that I wanted ask, which is very important. In our local government code, there's supposed to be a review clause there, where we're supposed to review and then amend our local government code. So why haven't we done that for the longest time? The second one, of course, under the parliamentary system, I'm looking at the more mature democratic parliamentary system here in the UK. It really is um, a matter of practice. See, if, if we have um, this practice, which we have, um, um, I, and I agree with you, Congressman, that we really need to have strong political parties, and that's the advantage of the parliamentary system. If we have conventions, norms, practice, then probably we could have no problem in shifting easily to a federal system of government. But probably, so it's, it's a, it's the two point, two points. Why don't we start with our local government code and then later on probably would find the means to shift towards the federal system of government. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Chapter, Dr. Medani, respond to the question. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's been a, a number of proposals actually to amend the code. Uh, we're not lacking in terms of proposal. Um, but the, the question is, uh, why has not this proposal actually uh, succeeded? And um, I think the, the many of the proposals would have uh, actually, any reform for that matter, would have uh, winners and losers. In fact, in, in the simple reform of the era, to make it equitable, there will be uh, some will gain, some will lose. So that uh, actually that's uh, a major problem when uh, uh, we design this reform. And uh, sometimes while those who will benefit uh, will be the, like a big, a bigger number, but uh, they have actually lesser to uh, less amount, but a bigger number. Sometimes it's very difficult really to consolidate them, to to uh, uh, to put them together. While those who would uh, lose, while they are few and they have a lot to lose, would actually fight a tooth and nail to maintain the system. So that uh, I think that's the, 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 the problem actually. And uh, many of the reforms, uh, when uh, there are actually clear winners and losers, and uh, 
those who will make the reforms are in the are, are those who will be beneficiaries or losers themselves, or some will be losers. Then uh, it's very difficult actually to come up uh, with those reforms. And I think that's also very basic when it comes to constitution making. In fact, I think uh, this is uh, uh, attributed to Rawls. Uh, when uh, those uh, when you do some basic rule making. Uh, you should not be in a position or you should not where to know where you will be at the end after after instituting these reforms. Uh, and uh, I think when, when we talk about federalism, we can be more idealistic, actually we can be more bold. That's why uh, uh, there is, well, uh, the, unlike when we talk about uh, uh, Changes amendments to the local government code were very sometimes very concrete. You can uh, already uh, have a good idea of what uh, uh, what uh, you will be at the end of the reform. Uh, when we talk about federalism, we can talk about actually what uh, based on say uh, designing it in a way that uh, you you are guided more by theories and principles uh, in which we can uh, be more open uh, to adopting those changes. When, when we talk about a very clear or very concrete matters like amendment to the local government code, wherein you have very specific uh, uh, results or outcome and you know uh, where you will be, whether, whether you will be losers or winners, sometimes it's very difficult to, really to, uh, to have those reform. Uh, and I, so that's why, uh, and I think when you talk about also the local government code, um, your simple amendments to the local government code. Uh, there are certain structures that uh, cannot amend uh, through the local government code. Like, uh, again, uh, one basic uh, characteristics of the local government system in the Philippines is that it's been really uh, so highly fragmented. Uh, there are just so many local government units uh, compared to, uh, and uh, how much, uh, Functions uh, like, for example, uh, we talk about the common pool resource. Um, how much, say, revenue raising powers can you devolve to these local government units, uh, given their uh, relatively small size, compared to, say, a region or a state, which can assume more significant functions? Uh, and so that's why uh, uh, I really have sometimes. Uh, 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 entertaining actually uh, this uh, uh, no, no, uh, opportunity of uh, introducing these major changes. Uh, th th I think that's, that's my position on that. to Congress, nothing much came out of that. Um, I think in 2005 maybe, another review, and then more recently there is a review led by the DILG in 2014-2015, so there have been attempts. The, the problem was even if there were draft bills, up to the point na may draft bills, nothing much moving Congress. And I think I have uh, alluded the reasons, I mean, I have said that in the presentation earlier. It's really many congressmen see the local officials as rivals. And I, I, had, I actually had a conversation with a group of governors who were ex-congressmen. Fairly recently, um, 2015, I think, we were talking about the proposed amendments, proposed studies under the DILG. And then the governor said, we think all these proposals, we agree with most of the proposals to amend. The problem is this will not pass Congress. 
Because if I were in Congress, I will not act on it. I have been there in that time. So this is one situation where your stand depends on where you sit, right? Some more questions from our audience. So I'll be getting three questions, uh, sir. One. Uh, any more questions? Yes, two. Sir, uh, <laughs> and Miss Andy from the legal. So, sir, you'll be the first one to ask the questions, and then Miss Andy will be the first one to ask the questions. I'm Tony Roland, former British of Lebanon. I understand that uh, there are recognized examples in the spectrum of uh, decentralization. The first is uh, delegation, the second is devolution, the third is regional autonomy, and federalism is only the fourth. Of course, uh, the local government court was a mode of devolution. The number two example. It appears that the present discussion does not cover the third. It's actually a leap from the local government code, the number two example, into the number four, which is federalism. What I'm saying is, haven't we actually pondered and considered? that Congress, even via a constitutional assembly, may just amend Section 15, Article 10 of the Constitution, and create more regional autonomous governments, not just the Cordillera and Muslim in general, and thereby avoid a situation where we have a federalism that Chief Justice the media will describe as a lethal experiment, and Chairman Monson will characterize as an irreversible damage if and when it fails. Because our brand of federalism, at least as proposed by PTP Laban, has no established precedent in any part of the world. It's actually the reverse situation for all historically working democracies, I mean federalist democracies. Because practically all democracies, I mean federalist uh, governments, started with independent entities and states deciding to federate. Upon the other hand, our case is a central government accommodating the local government units. And that's why uh, it would be disastrous. And so what I'm saying is, even dissecting to con us and con con or uh, con con, why not Congress convene as a constituent assembly? Amend, not revise, because federation would entail an issue. Amend section 15 of Article 10 and create as many regions as are historically and culturally integrated, economically viable, politically coherent, and geographically rational. Maybe that way you don't have to tinker with the local government code. Because, for example, the composition of the Senate cannot be legislated through a law. It's not in the Constitution. It should be 24. Upon the other hand, the grievance of the other regions of not being represented in the Senate may be remedied by equal representation from as many regions, as many autonomous regions that may henceforth be established. Because there was that criticism that sometime in the past, the province of Rizal and just one street in Rizal had three or four senators. You probably remember that situation. In other words, what I'm saying is, 
The problem is greater or disproportionate concentration of power and resources. Actually, Imperial Manila is only a symbol. It's in the highly centralized government. If that is the problem, I don't even see federation being the solution. The kind that is being proposed now, a semi-presidential hybrid parliamentary. What in heaven's name is the relation between a parliamentary setup and the relationship between the local government and the central government? Sir, uh, can we get to the point or to the question? My point is, why are we, we not talking about regional autonomy? which is a recognized example of decentralized arrangements. We are talking of the number two, which is devolution of the local government code, and federalization, which is the number four, which comes later at a more important time. Can, can we not focus also on? Because it's an issue, of, there is already a mechanism in the Constitution, section 15, article 10. There shall be created autonomous regions in Muslim in the Nawate Cordilleras, consisting of etc. Et Sir, yes. Um, may we know where, to whom speakers would you want to refer your questions? Any one of them? I think one of them are in the position. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, uh, gentlemen at the back, sir, uh, your question, please may I just remind you to please be brief and concise with your question or your comments. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Orville, and I'm from the Presidential Legislative Liaison Office. Um, as far as I know, this is not the, the first local government code that we have. We had a local government law in, in the 1970s, in the 1960s, even after immediately after World War II. Now, uh, my point is, we. Uh, I was just wondering why not any one of our esteemed speakers here did not discuss or uh, yeah, the issues of uh, institutional capacity and uh, technical capacity of human resources in the local governments. Because I think this is really the problem with the local government code. This is the unintended consequence of the local government code. Like, for instance, what it did in Muslim Mindanao and many of our regions in the periphery, where uh, um, I'll just give you an example. I just uh, attended the uh, hearing of the committee on local government this morning in the bank, about the Bangs of Moro region, and uh, I was amazed that uh, the TPWH of the ARM, as uh, an asset of the TPWH, said is very incompetent. That's the reason why. The, the TPWH projects are being implemented by regions 9, 10, and 12, and not the ARNM. And I, I myself am a region, a, a, a scholar on uh, Muslim Mindanao, and I, I went down and I saw how the classrooms look like. Children do not have, you know, they do not have tables and chairs, and they blame it to the lack of funds. And I found out in Maguindanao in 2012 alone, Governor Magunda Dato told us in Tokyo that the problem is 2% of his constituents, only 2% stepped into college. Because in Maguindanao, they do not have a state university. And this boils down to institutional capacity and the capacity, and that's why the, the reason why many of their politicians are remain, you know, but the ones, yeah, Sir, because they're uh, the can, ones can who are, yes, are, are get to the point of order. Yes. Question you want to, to that, that is why uh, I would like to point point these uh, problems. If what, why not federalize? You know, because it, I think it will give institutional capacity, and you know, I don't know. I, I just want to hear the, the uh, opinion of the esteemed speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Thank you. My question is for all three. I'm Sandy Paredes of the League of Provinces. My question is for the three speakers, because they, they posed the question to us, why pursue federalism, why not change the code? So we just want to know 
from their uh, perspective, what is their answer on those questions? But just to segue, no, I have a, a, a more specific question for Dr. Miral. Uh, on the when you presented earlier, sir, on the savings component, no, it appears because we, we might get the wrong people might get the wrong impression that the local governments had excess funds. Just taking a look at the statement of receipts and expenditures of the local governments, uh, more than 50% of this comes from NCR. Just for perspective, huh? and uh, so not all, most of the provinces. Siyempre, meron yung 5 to 10 percent reserve. Hindi na, kasi ano naman kami, on a uh, continuing appropriation. So, would you rather that we have negative? Uh, Siyempre, hindi, di ba? So, it's a good, it's, it's a good sign that uh, even even though our national government is in a definite, de, in a deficit uh, situation, our country is healthy because our local governments are, are, are run, uh, no? Okay, so uh, yun, that's one point. And um, do you think that um, how much should we uh, increase the local government share? Because in the Asia Pacific, there's a UCLG study of 101 countries. The average in the Asia Pacific, the share of subnational governments is 34%, and in the Philippines, it's only 15%. 15%. So how can we be competitive? How can we be vital partners in development, the local governments, uh, when our share in the public spending is only 15%? And in that study, there is a direct correlation between uh, the share of public spending and our share in GDP. So tataas yun, pag mas mataas ang share namin sa public spending. Which is why we, we are supportive of the federal uh, proposal of the president. But we are against any regional uh, set, setting up of a regional government because this is entirely new uh, to us, our political system. We, I just want to segue and, and take the opportunity of the presence of our congressman here that the governors passed a resolution uh, supporting the president's move to federalize. But uh, status quo, the least disruptive is the 81 provinces and the cities as federal states because by definition, subnational. Can, uh, can be provinces, can, should not be just limited to region. Because we have RDCs na eh. Strengthen the RDCs. Kasi ililipat mo lang ang political dynasty from the province to the region. Ganon din. And you're not, you're not devolving functions or powers. Yung pera ng train, na half ng train, mapupunta lang sa regional, setting up of regional uh, governments, eh, dapat ibinigay mo na for social development sa baba. Kesa gumastok ko magagasos ka ng PS and MOE and capital outlay. That's my question. Dr. Pilato. Yeah, first time. Yeah, uh, I was, you're referring to the consolidated uh, public sector financial position, uh, which reflects that the uh, national government uh, is in deficit, uh, like for example, a uh, production of 482 billion uh, in uh, 2017, and uh, while uh, the local government duties uh, are in a surplus to amounted to 200, close to 50% of the, the, the size of the deficit of the national government. And uh, if we look at the, uh, why is uh, basically um, the surplus um, of the, would basically come from the internal revenue allotment because after all, a major source of financing of the local government are from the internal revenue allotments. So that, uh, uh, now, and just for the uh, pure uh, cash management, because the actually cash is a cost, cost of financing. Uh, the, the national government is borrowing, so it's incurring a, a financing cost. And on the other hand, the local government is in a surplus, and, uh, uh, which may be just lying on, uh, in the bank. So and, uh, you, have, you now have, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, problems about inadequate uh, infrastructure and social services. So that's, not, that's one thing to, talk, uh, to think about. So I'm just, think, uh, uh, I'm just posing the question, would it be just uh, really lack of uh, pouring in more resources to the local government and that uh, really thinking of how to, uh, 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 how to improve the delivery of the, of, uh, of the services? 
And uh, as I pointed out earlier, one of the uh, possible constraints to, this, uh, to the local government system is the highly fragmented local government uh, uh, units. And uh, that's why you, it's very difficult, uh, maybe when it comes to uh, like providing for the much needed uh, critical infrastructure, which would re require huge uh, capital spending, the different local government units individually are not in a position to provide those kinds of spending. That's why they cannot spend for those kinds of capital expenditure. So I, again, I, my premise was that uh, we need bigger uh, local government units. And the proposal actually to uh, shift to a federal, go, uh, federal s uh, type of government, well, um, many are, would not like to, uh, to uh, propose this upfront because uh, they may, the proposal may lack support from the local government unit. Is we must actually think of rationalizing the local government uh, system because after all, uh, if we try to rationalize it, some levels may, may, may need to be abolished. So that, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, I, <laughs> uh, it really depends because after all, uh, when uh, the different uh, regions are asked to internalize the cost of setting up government units, then they may think of rationalizing it. In fact, in many countries like, the, like Australia, there's really a, a, a policy to amalgamate, to rationalize the number. And if you look at many of the countries, they have actually reduced the number of their uh, subnational government units. So that actually in, in, the, in the system wherein the regional, the different regions are asked to internalize the cost of uh, setting up the different local government units. Some may say that uh, uh, we need to, say, abolish some, uh, some level of government. So I'm not actually predicating the proposal on uh, maintaining the existing local government system because, uh, after all, the, 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 the power to design the local government system, since it in the competencies of the regional government, will be uh, up to the regional government themselves what kind of local government system uh, does it want to have? Uh, um, chat for, uh, <coughs> okay, but there were... Just one point on the institutional and perhaps what is meant is technical capacity. I, I think if you're talking of technical capacity, the requirements will be the same, whether it's federal or or uh, a more decentralized unitary system. Pareho lang nakailangan mo ng mas marami. So it's, it's not an argument uh, na magagamit mo, I think, of uh, favoring one for a system over another. Yeah, maybe you want to pursue your question. Um, okay. I just want to know the same okay. um, The problem of the local government code is that uh, when it involves many functions, it uh, uh, deconcentrated many uh, uh, functions of the government, but uh, lacked enough funds. So, yung mga hospitals, hindi na kaya ng mga, mga malilit ng provincia, mga poor provinces, especially in the Cordillera, in Itugao. Uh, it's, it's a province that has no hospital now. And the province does not have enough money. So, um, yun yung ibig kong sabihin, maraming mga, mga probinsya hindi ready na sa local government code. And as I, I've said, hindi bago ang local government code. Meron, meron tayong mga local government uh, act of 1974, meron tayong 1960s, no 1940s. So why, why bakit tuloy pa natin yung sistema? Meron ang pinipresenta ang bagong presidente natin, eh, subukan na rin natin ito. Yes, I think it will it will be able also to uh, answer these uh, problems of uh, institutional capacities and ma ma empower yung mga tao sa mga uh, Are you referring your question to to all of them or? Uh, yes, no problem. Okay. Uh, I was yes, Pam and the gentleman at the back. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Manalo from uh, CBI. Um, I'm just um, 
I'd like to ask about um, you know, vested rights. I would like to talk about vested rights. You know, like local uh, governments were given certain powers under the local government code. And uh, usually, in the uh, cases where we draft new laws, we recognize that the vested right. We don't want to keep up whatever has been gained, whatever privileges and powers that were already given uh, in the first place. So in the case of local governments, these powers were established or given to them through the local government. If we are really pursuing federalism, I was wondering if maybe from Mam Chan and I don't know, Dr. Miran, uh, if we have identified really certain provisions, what is it in the local government code that fundamentally conflicts a good federalism design? Okay, uh, thank you, Pam. I think we need one more question from the, sir. Sir Mendoza, no? uh, sir, you 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 mentioned you uh, pag pag ilang beses kung po kasi nakatayong sa seminar na kayo ang speaker, you always mentioned yung Imperial Manila. So, uh, kung magkisip po ba ng federalism, uh, how are we going to go about it? Is it would it be uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical? Because if it would be asymmetrical, so may kakaroon pa rin po ba ng parang uh, Imperial na pasarili Manila could be other state? Yeah, siguro yun na lang po muna yung tanong. Sige, Ma'am Chad and Dr. Miral are the best and interested. Just to answer, Pam, very quickly, uh, about ano yung mali dun sa local government code that can be corrected perhaps when either we amend or move to a federal system of government. First is lack of clarity of function. Second, lack of revenue autonomy, or at least to increase the revenue autonomy of local governments. Third, um, fiscal equalization, kulang. Uh, and then consistency, internal consistency of the four pillars. Kasi ngayon, dahil unclear yung functions, hindi mo alam kulang ba talaga? yung ira o so or or tama lang o hindi kasi nagtuturuan di ba so hindi mo alam alin pa talaga so so if only for that i think that has to be clarified and then yung yung issue ng vested rights uh and yung, uh, the move to a federal that that i i think that brings us to a very slippery slope uh, because that means, contrary to what uh, June is saying, na parang may ulitan, di ba po naglalaro yung mga bata po nag-aaway na kayo, ulitan na lang, ulitan. Uh, parang sinasabi ni June, pag nag-federal, there is an element of ulitan there. Erase natin lahat, ulitan tayo. But when you think, when you start to think of vested rights, then walang ulitan doon. Nandun pa din silang lahat. And to me, that, that becomes a problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with Chad. Uh, I, I think we understand uh, whether you go federalism or amendments of the local government code. It's very important to uh, clearly delineate, uh, to assign clearly the functions of each level of government. And I think uh, one problem in the local government code is that uh, while uh, it delineates the deep, uh, the fact or devolves the functions of the local, uh, identifies some of the functions of the local government, on the other hand, it allows the, the national government to be involved, uh, actually to augment, the word is to augment the the provision of the these devolved services, especially when funded through the general appropriations act. So actually, uh, somehow the, the the delineation or the assignment of our uh, uh, functions becomes not very clear. And um, and I think that this is where um, uh, 
federalism somehow, uh, uh, in a way, forces you to be more disciplined. Because uh, now it forces you to identify specifically in the Constitution what are the functions and powers of the different levels of government and, and so that you have to clearly think, up, think clearly about all these functions, about all these powers, uh, which may not, in the, in, because in the, in the local government code, in the way it is implemented, again, the national government can unilaterally uh, take back or even uh, to leave because of its uh, resources can uh, even uh, not honor what is uh, provided for in the whole. So uh, uh, I think it is in that regard where uh, uh, somehow federalism would have that disciplining uh, uh, element that is uh, lacking uh, in, the, in the local government code. With regards to the last question, let me try to link my answer also to that last point, maybe as a way to close. Yes. The disciplining cannot just happen on Imperial Manila. I, I think uh, because the target is often Imperial Manila and you know, its excesses, right? Uh, whether or not you agree with that, and Mahar Mangas actually had a nice article the other day questioning the very issue of what is Imperial about Manila. But the disciplining has to go both ways. It has to go and become strengthened at the local government level and also at the central level. So it's really a spectrum of uh, reforms I think that is necessary. So even though we call the win the president a winner take all, every six years you basically have a reset button. You can basically take out a number of reforms and start up again, which is the discontinuity that our business people are complaining about all the time, right? Um, I think the, the challenge there is both sides need to upgrade the, the governance uh, dynamic. So the question was, uh, how do we transition towards if federalism were to happen, what would happen to, to Imperial Manila? Uh, I think this is the issue, is that both sides need to be stronger. And I really have to see in the proposals how specifically that strength will, will take place. Because so far as I see it, there is an emphasis on resource transfers, but not yet an emphasis on greater accountability of those transfers or, or of those resources uh, used. Yeah, I think it's a uh, time check is around, it's already 4.30, and I think we already uh, uh, extended so much time for, for, um, for our speakers and for our audience to, to ask these questions. So I guess, uh, I think, uh, uh, I think our speakers uh, did a very, a very, very good job in uh, trying to answer the question we, we pose uh, in this forum. Uh, for all those who were not able to get copies of the PowerPoint presentations, it's uh, accessible at our website, cpbrd.congress.gov. Ph. So again, can we please give our speakers a round of uh, applause for, for the discussion? And uh, the CPPRD and uh, PIDS would like to extend uh, our thanks to all the participants in today's forum. Thank you, and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much.